Hey gang, and welcome to the Cyrano's Place channel. I'm Coach Cass, and today we're giving you the second installment of Fencing Math. Now, we've talked about the numbers on a pool sheet, and how you add them up, and how to understand it. Now we're going to look at how we're going to do the preliminary seating, and what happens afterwards. Why this is important. Let's go talk to a balcony. Come on. In the balcony, once upon a time, when we didn't have computer systems to enter information and figure out the seating, we did everything on file cards. It was very common as the Great Lakes section chair running a tournament of 30 some fencers in a given event. The night before, I was sitting around writing these cards. Cards had name, club affiliation, and the rating so we can figure it out. I'll show you that in a moment. What would happen is we'd have these stack of cards and as people check in, we'd put their names in and we could take all the other names and figure out who was missing. Kind of like we do now when we print out the registration forms. It was very important to take care of these cards and make sure nobody messed them up. Let me show you the basic theory of how tournaments were seated based on a field of 18 with three pools. First step was to seed everybody one through, in this case, 18. Next, we'd put our first three fencers at the top of the first three pools. After that, we snick each of the fencers back and forth to try and make the pools as even as we can. Again, here's the pattern as we go back and forth. If there were a bigger field and more pools, we would snake from the first pool to the last and then back again. Now here's something really cool. If you add each column up, they all add up to 57, making them relatively even. So for the sake of the seating, we have a name, a club, and a rating. So the name isn't relevant to our seating, so I've left the names off. The club, we just need to know it's different from the other clubs. So we have seven clubs represented here. The C19 represents C is the strength of the fencer, and 19 represents the year in which the fencer earned their ratings. So I'm going to first start with the highest rated fencers, which are my A's. An A19 is stronger than A17. So that's going to be my first seed and my second seed. Then I'm going to go to my B's. Even though I have a B18 versus an A17, an A is stronger than the B. The B18 is higher than the B17. Then we have two C's of equal strength, because they're both 19s. And then for our D's, we want the 19s, the 18, and the 16th. Now we go to our E's. We've got an E20, E19s, 18s, and 17, and then all our U's who are equal strength. Once I've seeded my fencers, one through however many are in the field, and in this case we have 22, the next thing I have to decide is how many pools and how many people are going to be in each pool. If it's 21, that's an easy three pools of seven, but 22 would mean three pools with one pool having eight. We really don't want to have eight people in a pool. Normally, you want to have five to seven fencers. U.S. Fencing Association asks for regional cups that you put pools of seven as often as you can. If you've got 10 fencers, it's two pools of five. If it's 14 fencers, it's two pools of seven. Now today, we can do it all on the computer with all sorts of wonderful software that can figure this out and it'll pop up how many pools you want to use based on the number of entries. So we don't even have to figure out the seating. The computer does it for us. But the computer will also sneak it internally in the same way I showed you with the 18. One of the things that the computer will take care of for you is figure out affiliation and conflicts. So if you've got four pools and five fencers from the same club, you should have one pool with two people and each of the other pools should have only one from that given club. The computer will do it for you so you don't have to figure these conflicts out, which makes things a lot easier. Once upon a time though, when we were working with cards and the format was pools to pools to pools, what you could do if you want to kind of help your teammate out is you drop your bow to them so that they had an extra win and somebody else wouldn't move up. This is part of the reason why formatting for the second round, or in our case now the BB, changed. Ted has something to tell us about that. Back in Nationals in 1977, I was in a pool of six and half moved up. There was a three-way tie. I was in the tie for indicators. I lost out. I didn't advance. I had a friend who was also at the 
he was in a pool and when he came over, I asked him how he did. He says he didn't win about. I thought, oh, sorry to hear that. He goes, but I moved up. He was in a pool of seven. Three people did not show for the call and did not fence. So he moved up and I didn't. Those were the old days. So to avoid the situation that Ted experienced in the 1977 Nationals, we take the entire field and figure out the seeding based on the results. The first thing that's considered is the win-loss percentage. Second, the indicator, the difference between hits sent and hits received. If the indicator is the same and the percentage win is the same, an esoteric rule says the person who made more hits goes over the person who made less hits even though they had the same indicator. Why? The basic concept is you want to have fencing more active, kind of like the difference between a soccer game that goes for an hour and has a score of 1-0 versus a basketball game that has like 102 to 98 or something. A lot more action happening. So we want the fencers more active and we want to reward them for making more touches versus less to move up on the seating. Once you listed everybody out of the pools in their order, it's time to look at the DE or direct elimination tableau. Here's an example of a tableau with eight, where you can see number one fences number eight, five fences four, three fences six, and two fences seven. This will continue to fold down kind of like a March Madness tableau until we have a final winner. Now here's another example of a tableau of 16. Same thing, we've just added another round. And when you do this over and over and over to make a bigger field, 32, 64, 128, you start getting into really huge, huge tournaments like we see at the national level. And here's where that indicator becomes so important because the bigger the field, the more important that seeding could be. So the last thing you want is to hit like the number one seed when you're the 64th seed coming out way too early. Kind of better to be seated in the middle so you can try and work your way up sometimes, unless you know you are the best. Now again, back in the day when we were doing cards, it was very important to make sure you did the math right, you checked it, and then you wrote it on the cards and so on. And it took a lot of focus and intensity to make sure you didn't make a mistake, because if you made a mistake, that was not good. What might happen is something like this. What's that? You don't want to get in the way of balcony. Now today, they only have to put the pool sheets in on their computer system, and they still check it and make sure there's no error. Because again, if there's an error, we've got a problem in the next round of seeding. One of the things you should consider at a tournament, whether or not it's running on time or not running on time, whatever's going on, don't bug the bow committee. They're doing the best they can. And if you bug them, you might be causing more issue than you want. So I hope that clarifies what goes on behind the scenes at a tournament and how much you really want to respect people who know what they're doing in the bow committee. Because what happens if the computer system goes down? Can you still run that tournament? Personally, I know I can, but then again, I was running tournaments on file cards before there were computer systems. Okay, I'm not as old as Ted, but you get what I'm saying. If you've got other questions, please put them in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe, like, share, and we would love to have you be a patron of Cyrano's Place through Patreon for as little as $2 a month. You can help support these educational fencing videos for yourself and others in the fencing community. The link's below. Until next time, catch you later.